it's actually an honor to give the C.K. Prahlad Memorial Lecture. I had the privilege of knowing Dr. Prahlad and his whole family for uh, 20 years, actually. And uh, I will say, nobody uh, exemplifies a chief learning officer more than Dr. Prahlad did. If you think about his career, at the peak of his career, when companies and CEOs were calling him for advice and paying him top dollar, he was spending quite a bit of time in India with the emerging IT sector, which wasn't yet uh, globally well known. He was spending lots of time with a group called the Indus Entrepreneurs, which were mostly entrepreneurs who were not uh, big on the global scene just yet. Uh, and he was spending a lot of time actually being an expert in, in fields you wouldn't imagine, like the migratory patterns of birds. And so Dr. Prahlad was always a lifelong learner. What I'd like to do today with my remarks is tell you a little bit about uh, how the speed of innovation and the economic realities of the United States are changing how higher education is functioning in the U.S. Uh, and then lead that into a little bit of a discussion about uh, some work I've been doing in India with universities. Uh, and then hopefully if we have a little time, uh, as you all know this week the announcement came out that uh, American universities and foreign universities can set up in India uh, as nonprofits. And I'd actually love to get some feedback from people in the audience as to what that means, because I think the opportunity is enormous, and many of you will be the beneficiary uh, of the entrance of foreign universities. Uh, but it's a real question as to what they can do to add value, and how American universities think about uh, their focus in India. Uh, so let's get started. So one of the things we're seeing is a global phenomenon, the rise of the innovator and the entrepreneur. Uh, as we can, as if you look at universities around the world, entrepreneurship has become a pillar of their uh, function. It's a pillar of their mission as an institution. Uh, some of the ones that I've worked with, MIT and Stanford, are probably the best known in the world. Uh, the Deshpande Center for Technological Innovation uh, was one of the first proof of concept centers, really saying how do you take a research university and uh, connect everybody in that university to think about innovation and entrepreneurship as a part of their mission of academia. Uh, and that's been replicated around the world. Uh, as our host mentioned, I've been involved in Hubli Darwar in Karnataka, where we have 10,000 people annually working on entrepreneurial activities. Northeastern University, where I am now, historically was focused on getting uh, its students working in the professional sector in large companies. In parallel to that large corporate focus, has developed an entrepreneurship track that's now uh, well regarded in the United States. In India, the new entrepreneur network, set, national entrepreneurship network set by the Wadwani Foundation has grown now to uh, 70,000 members, and they actually claim to have reached uh, over 3 million potential entrepreneurs in India. Uh, and the two most important things on the bottom, 450 American universities that I worked with when I was in the Obama administration now have entrepreneurship as integral to their student experience. So what does this mean for the learning community? It means that we really need to rearrange the syllabus uh, for the entrepreneur. And what I mean by that is that the skills that institutions are, are providing to their students and if it's companies providing to their employees are still relevant. But it looks like we need to rearrange the order for the journey that the entrepreneur takes. And so the questions are, uh, is the entrepreneurial journey the same regardless of the region, the sector, or the individual that's taking that journey? What are the jobs that are actually waiting for our graduates and our employees out there? Uh, and that, how is that relevant to why entrepreneurship has taken off? What are the core skills you require for that journey? Uh, and then how is the speed of innovation changing the way that we learn and teach? So when you think about the entrepreneurial journey, is it the same? I'm going to bring two examples to you that uh, on first blush would seem entirely different. Uh, these are two organizations that I've worked closely with. Kickboard is a for-profit uh, startup company in New Orleans, Louisiana, in the United States. They work with charter schools and private schools. These are often uh, the students who are the most intelligent in their communities. Uh, often uh, in private schools, there are other means as well. Uh, and they provide data analytics to those schools to help them train and, and teach better. Augusta International Foundation is an NGO working in Bangalore that some of you may have heard of, uh, that does science fairs and mobile science vans for rural schools in India. And on first blush, you'd say that these two have nothing in common except that they're in the education space and they're trying to help children in the K-12 space. But the journey of their employees, of their entrepreneur and all, is exactly the same. It's access to financing to grow their idea. It's access to paying customers, which in both cases is school districts uh, and, and states and other uh, sort of uh, providers of education. It's growing a management team with the experience in the space they're in. In the U.S., actually, there's a lot of education technology startups, but there's not a lot of managers who've been in the education space. 
In India, there's a lot of people who've been in the education space. There's not as much expertise in education technology. But the challenge is still, it's still the same. How do I find a management team to help me grow this idea? Uh, similarly, continuous innovation. Uh, both organizations have used their early capital to figure out what their value add uh, actually is. So with Kickstart, it was originally with charter schools. They expanded. They realized that private schools would pay the bills so that they could reach urban uh, uh, charter schools that cannot necessarily pay them for their services. With Augustia, it was innovation and using their funds to figure out that the van they had outfitted in science uh, equipment was not a scalable model, but that doing science fairs was. Uh, and then, of course, rapid growth to have impact and satisfy their investors. Secondly, we're seeing that the reason there's so much of a focus on entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship within companies is that that's around where the job growth is going to be. So in the U.S., uh, if you haven't seen the Kauffman Foundation study, the majority of the job growth, and this isn't like 51%, this is like over 60% uh, from 2006 to 2012, was a small, fast-growing companies. Now, some will say that we had a recession, and that's why that happened. But the reality is that that trend was continuing for the last 20 years, and we expect the next Kauffman report to come out to say the same, that uh, growth in jobs and career tracks is with emerging companies uh, that are innovation-driven. Seven out of the ten job growth areas, according to Money Magazine, are in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. The other three are somewhat related to that. It's uh, around real estate and, uh, uh, and things like that, that commercial real estate development and things of that nature that, that are the direct outgrowth of companies growing. Forty percent of college students in America today identify entrepreneurship as their career goal. Partially this is because big companies are not hiring, because Wall Street is not paying bonuses, uh, but regardless, entrepreneurship is how they view themselves. Maybe not immediately after graduation, but over the next 20 years, they will be entrepreneurs. Uh, and they have desires for careers that cannot be outsourced, frankly. In the United States, that's certainly a big deal. They want to save the world, but they also want a career path that won't disappear uh, in 10 to 15 years. So something came about a few years ago called the Lean Startup Movement. And essentially, that was looking at what are the core skills that an individual needs to be an entrepreneur? Uh, and essentially it was to say, rather than a full educational experience, what you need is the skills to get to version 1.0 of whatever it is you're going to do. So that's going to be the technical skills that are required for everything. Whether you want to be a journalist, or you want to come up with the next uh, uh, clean technology that's going to save the world, technical skills are going to be required. If you want to do work registration, you still probably need to understand how to do web design and mobile applications. So technical skills. Uh, secondly, the ability to create and work on small budgets. Uh, this is sort of, budgeting has never been a big part of the curriculum in the United States, but uh, all of a sudden it's a big deal as everybody's thinking about entrepreneurship. The ability to work with people across disciplines. So no longer are you a student in uh, engineering or business. You are multidisciplinary, you're taking courses across the institution, uh, because the work you'll do in a small company requires that diversity of skills. Sales, not business development. Uh, those of you who've been in sales know what that means, that we need to uh, teach our young people with the skill, the willingness to roll up their sleeves, get out there, hustle, make 100 calls, uh, and only one of them will go through and, and sort of uh, build those skill sets, rather than thinking about the strategic uh, sort of marketing aspect of what's going on. So how do we do this? Well, different schools are looking at it different ways. Uh, one is to teach entrepreneurship across departments and across schools. So Arizona State University, one of the largest universities in America, uh, now teaches entrepreneurship to every student that comes in there, whether it's journalism, law, medicine. It's a broad-based introduction to you know, entrepreneurship with the idea that it's not the entrepreneur biggie, it's the idea of how does the individual take the idea and see it to reality? How do we provide them with the skills uh, to take what they do and make, make something real out of it? Uh, secondly, MIT is uh, mirroring the innovation cycle of companies and bringing it in. That's essentially what the proof of concept model is, is to say, how does Google innovate? Well, let's bring that to the campus. Let's take it, uh, bring people from different departments together, bring the equivalent of marketing and sales, which is a business school uh, with engineering, and let's think about technologies uh, and the pathway for those technologies that will be most relevant. Relevant case studies is something actually we first started doing in, in, in Hubli, uh, we found some business schools in North Karnataka that were teaching their business students about uh, Google and Facebook. Well, those students are never going to work at Google and Facebook. And so it was an entirely irrelevant experience. It was nice to know, uh, but the relevant experience they needed was with a company like VRL, which is a big company in North Karnataka. And so how do you find the relevant experiences for the entrepreneurship that they will undertake? It's nice to be aspirational, but it's not necessarily relevant to what they're doing. And then finally, thinking about uh, promotion of failure, 
promotion of experimentation uh, in a much broader way than culturally has been done even in the United States. So how is the speed of innovation changing how we formally learn? So not only do people want to be entrepreneurs and therefore need a sort of a different, more uh, sort of truncated skill set to get started, uh, but the speed with which technology is moving is changing how we learn as well. So I'll give you an example about social media. Uh, there was a nice study done that uh, in 2000, uh, 2008, uh, most of the social media development was on a, on a web platform, and, and that's what the universities were teaching. But by 2010, it was moving to mobile, and most of the universities did not have the curriculum in place uh, to actually teach on mobile, and so a lot of companies had to do it themselves. Now, I don't know if this is as big a problem in India, but it, was, it generally had to do with the challenges universities have, the creation of content, getting accredited for it, rolling it out, the academic year, it just takes time. Well, social content, social media was not waiting for that. They were moving forward. And so universities found themselves uh, taking a back seat to other providers of education and the companies themselves. Even MOOCs, which are less than a year old, are already going through a transition because we've seen the failure rate. Uh, Coursera talks about it themselves, uh, where only 12% of the graduate uh, uh, people taking a lot of their courses are finishing. Now that's somewhat skewed because in India, they have a large number of students taking courses, but those students are not interested in finishing, they're interested in actually learning the content, they're not looking for the accreditation. Uh, but nevertheless, universities are thinking about how do we uh, provide online learning? Is it a MOOC? Is it a mixture of virtual and online with some sort of an uh, active presence? Uh, San Jose State actually pulled out of uh, Coursera because they felt that the uh, participation and the high failure rates was affecting their brand and their ability to recruit. Uh, and so there's a lot of change going on even now uh, with, uh, with online learning. So the, the point of this is that innovation is happening so fast uh, that we have to think about other ways to train our students. So the biggest way to do that has been to look outside of academia for models. So one of the first things that's, that uh, the Gates Foundation did in this space was to help fund and create something called the Common Core. And that was essentially to say that school children across the United States now need to learn a core set of skills that don't necessarily have to do with algebra or geometry or calculus, but they are a core set of skills that they can use across multiple uh, career pathways. They may start in, in journalism, they may move into technology, they may move into clean tech, but there's a core set of math, English, uh, professional skills that they need, and how do we provide those to everybody? And the rest of it is up to them, but there's a common core that we must have relevant to the 21st, econ uh, 21st century economy. In India, we see this with greater investment in education. All of you, uh, India is well known for having more of a corporate engagement in education than almost any other country. Uh, and you see that in terms of companies, the corporate universities, certification, all of that. Uh, the model I'll talk about a little bit later is cooperative education that uh, my university, Northeastern University, and a few others have done, which is to say that half of the ex student experience, undergraduate or graduate, is in the field uh, and not in the classroom, and half will be in the classroom. So how is this transforming American universities? Well, if you, in 2002, when we launched the Deshpande Center at MIT, uh, there were not a lot of universities that placed entrepreneurship uh, as part of its core mission. Uh, now, 450 colleges and universities have identified it as part of their core, core mission. I know uh, Duke is here, and they have one of the best programs uh, in the country as well. I know there's some other universities here. Uh, and so we have 145 major research universities that have put it there, 50 regional universities. In the United States, we usually have a flagship state university in every state, and then there's regional campuses of that state university. So that 90 refers to regional universities, most of which are not innovation-driven research universities. They are places that people go to college, and yet they are focusing on whatever innovation they can find on campus uh, and on entrepreneurship. Uh, again, these are often in smaller cities, and these cities have decided that their economic future is around entrepreneurship, that General Motors is not going to open a plant uh, in uh, rural Kentucky. Actually, they might these days, but uh, for the most part, nobody's going to open a plant and hire 3,000 people. So we need to train enough entrepreneurs to hire those 3,000 people and grow over a 20-year period. Uh, historically, black colleges and universities, local community colleges, which are low-cost, based in their communities, all are supporting entrepreneurship. And again, this is out of uh, two realities. One, the United States economy, the lack of high, uh, large numbers of people being employed by uh, individual companies these days. And secondly, by the desires of students to be entrepreneurs. Uh, often this is driven by uh, presidential and trustee focus. So what, you know, the trustees of universities in the United States tend to be the captains of industry. Uh, and they are saying that this needs to be a focus. Why? Because it's a question of where the jobs will be for their graduates. 
It's a question of what's the role of the institution in their community, that if you are uh, Northeastern University in Boston, although that's uh, uh, maybe not the best example, my, my wife went to the University of Illinois. Uh, if you're the University of Illinois, you are one of the research institutions for the southern part of that state and for the state of Illinois and Chicago. Uh, you have a responsibility to, to make sure that the innovation and the research you do is benefiting the state that you are a part of and that those innovative companies stay there and grow there and not necessarily go to Silicon Valley or to Bangalore or to Boston. And so this idea of lifelong learning, connection to your community, and your role in economic development of your community has taken a, uh, a place. And so Northeastern, uh, they ended up raising $5 million for a Center for Research Innovation and focused on it as part of their uh, commitment to their uh, students. Uh, what we also found is that a lot of large companies that Northeastern worked with, uh, they were very focused on new product development and they were not looking at uh, internal, they were looking for students to, to focus on product development uh, outside of companies and then hopefully we'll bring it in and see what they can they can do together. So here's a couple of examples of, of what I'm talking about. Uh, making entrepreneurship critical to the student experience. I'm not going to focus on every one, but I want to sort of link one example, one or two from each, uh, because I think it's also relevant for how uh, business thinks about it. So the business plan competition has become a staple now in companies and in universities. But there's two models that I think are interesting to look at. One is Washington University, which said, you know what, we're not going to just highlight the person who can do the best PowerPoint presentation or who speaks the best English. We're going to highlight the person who consistently keeps to their idea and meets deliverable after deliverable over a period of the year. So the $50,000 prize no longer goes to the best PowerPoint and the flashiest presentation. It goes to the individual who spends the year, finds the customers, develops the product. Uh, and that we're seeing a lot more companies do that as well with their own internal innovation process development is that the prizes are not based on the idea, but on the actual ability to get traction on the idea, convince your coworkers, and move forward. Uh, Rice University in Houston is one of the best engineering colleges in America. And they said, you know what, we are the engineering talent for Houston. Houston does not have a big entrepreneurial community. Let's use our business plan to really jumpstart this. So they annually raise $1 million for their business plan contest, and it has really changed the face of Houston. There's probably over, I think uh, it was a 150 funded startups in the greater Houston area now, up from less than 10 just a few years ago because of Rice. So as an economic development engine, as a as an engine for, for focusing on innovation among students and faculty, it's become a big deal. Nurturing faculty to find relevance in their research and innovation. So faculty don't have much uh, incentive to think about commercialization unless they were uh, already interested in it. Some of the things that I think are interesting that we're seeing is that more and more courses people are doing what University of Pittsburgh is doing, which is to say uh, we are going to require our faculty to think about the relevance of their research. How do we think about the innovation? Uh, and secondly, we're going to bring in the people from the outside to help them identify what the relevance is. So how do you bring in 30, you bring in 30 corporations to the University of Pittsburgh uh, and you have them look at the technology and say, hey, this is relevant to us. How do we think about this? How do we train our employees for this technology as it comes down the road? Uh, and then how do we commercialize this and actually build a company around it? Secondly, the University of Virginia has done something radical in the U.S. and that's tie the tenure to uh, actual thinking about commercializations, patent filings, things this, of this nature. Uh, the tenure system in the United States is, uh, you know, it's sort of a sacred cow in higher education. Uh, but some schools are now saying for younger faculty, it can't just be about publishing in, in journals and putting it on shelf. It has to be about the relevance of that research and that experience to our world today. Tech transfer, I'll skip over because that's, I think, not as relevant for this, uh, for this conversation. Uh, welcome in the outside world. And this is where many of you come in, even large corporations. Historically, there is some hostility to working with the corporate sector in American higher education. Out of necessity for getting funds in a time of of, of government, a shortage of government funds. Uh, many are, are engaging more and more with corporations. Uh, Clemson is a wonderful example whereby they have really become a research center for the automotive industry in South Carolina. And originally companies came to South Carolina in the south, southern part of the United States because of the low cost of labor. Uh, but the research that Clemson does now in partnership directly with the companies has actually made it a hub in a very proactive way. It's a place where people go to do R&D uh, for new brands of cars. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, some other examples I think are relevant in India as well is the University of Delaware where they use, companies are using the university to further the R&D on products that they'd like to see. So they are coming to the university and saying, this is what we're working on internally. We don't have the expertise yet. Can you help us? Can you help us uh, think about the research, but also then train 
our, our employees on where this technology is going, what this new area might be. And finally, providing uh, local leadership for economic development. I mentioned this earlier. Tulane University is in the city of New Orleans, uh, and after the Hurricane Katrina in 2005, they did a real pivot and said, we are the leading university in our city. Our city is under distress. We need to teach our students to care about the city. And so 100% of the students at Tulane University now, which is one of the larger private universities, are required to do a project in their city. And so what it's done is really changed the face of the university. It's changed the way they learn. The outside of classroom experience is just as relevant as the classroom experience here at Tulane. We're seeing similar trends in corporations across the United States where the innovation cycle within companies is being expanded out to, uh, to uh, departments that weren't necessarily uh, earlier engaged. You know, at, at the top companies like the Google and the Apple, uh, marketing and sales and finance always sit with the engineers and product development. But that's not been the case historically with American companies. We're seeing a lot more of that integration of divisions and departments when it comes to cutting edge innovation. We're also seeing a greater awareness of the innovator's dilemma and thinking about the cutting edge products uh, that may uh, um, uh, cannibalize their, their main source of revenue. So companies are very cognizant of the innovator's dilemma and are looking at universities and others as a source to find uh, the technology that will help them uh, get through that. And then finally, greater connection to regional ecosystems. Again, if, if a company is going down a path and set a strategy to follow a specific uh, product line. Uh, how do you stay abreast of the latest technology, the latest thinking? It's through universities and startups in your community. And so they're sending out their senior executives to, to participate at universities and proof of concept centers, things of that nature, rather than trying to do it in-house. A couple of things we did uh, when I was in Washington, we created a $100 million fund for universities to promote innovation, commercialization, and entrepreneurship. So this is the United States government gives about $57 billion a year to universities to conduct research. So this is a very small amount of money on top of that, but this allows them to spend it on the business development side uh, of uh, the R&D, not on the R&D directly. So you can continue with the cancer research, but then here's a little bit of money to figure out how do you actually make that into a, a cancer drug. We also, I think it's, a, I think it's an interesting in India, we put this website up called data.gov, and that was a fellow Indian American named Vivek Kundra, who was the chief information officer, who came up with this idea and put it up. This is essentially to take every government data set and put it online. Now, it's been a mixed bag. Some are Excel spreadsheets, some are fairly complicated uh, databases. But the idea was the more information we make available that the government has, which is tons and tons and tons of information, the more it can drive uh, improvements in healthcare, improvements in education, and can create a whole series of entrepreneurs who will take that data and build platforms around it. So it's been a mixed bag so far. Some things have come out that's useful. Uh, certainly in the health IT space, uh, it's... Um, and, and just to, on the future of online learning, what's interesting about online learning is that we have an infrastructure in the United States, and probably in India, uh, that is based on the large institution. And the questions being asked are, if you take an online course that's $1,000, how do I get the financial aid for that? Right now I get a, a loan from the government, it goes to my institution. Uh, I, go to, I was at Northeastern University, went to them, they took a fee, they processed it, it went through. But if I only want to take one course and I can't afford it, how do we do that? So thinking about the regulations around uh, accreditation of online learning, access to online learning, how do we bring access to communities that don't have it, uh, and then finally the financing. So does this apply to India? I think the belief is that it pretty much does, that this, it's a large market for entrepreneurs or anybody, uh, and particularly, obviously, the middle class, but also the bottom of the pyramid market, which on the US, there's a lot of interest among, particularly among young people in, in reaching this market. Uh, we see the employability gap impacting growth in large and small companies. These are things that have been talked about uh, before, but the low employability rates among university graduates, the NASCOM study that showed about 20% of the engineers are, are employable. Uh, and then corporate retraining of university graduates. So this idea, what is the application in India? Can you bring outside factors in to the Indian academic institution to supplement the learning experience so that some of these challenges of low employability, low, employability, uh, low uh, professionalism uh, can be addressed early on rather than requiring companies to put a whole lot into corporate retraining. So one of the things I've been doing with Northeastern University is thinking about this in India. So if you think about Northeastern, it has 20,000 uh, full-time students, which is quite large. When I went there, it was a local school in, in, 
Boston area that serve local students. But what has happened over the last 10 years is because of the economy in the United States, the model at Northeastern University, which is to go to school five years, of which three are in the classroom and two are in the workforce, has really skyrocketed. 44,000 applications in 2012, largest of any private university in America. Now, there are a lot of private universities that are better, uh, but Northeastern has become very popular because of this uh, mix of, of, uh, of cooperative education, workplace, and, uh, and learning. So 90% of the students who are employed there graduate, uh, have a job within uh, nine months of graduation. Uh, and as my next slide will show, about 50% of them end up working where they've, they've actually done their cooperative experience. If you can read this, it's a little bit small, so I'll just go through quickly. So 7,500 students of those 20,000 uh, actually uh, do the co-op. That actually works out to about 90% of those who are eligible. It's a six-month intensive work experience conducted two to three times over their uh, educational period. 3,000 different employers around the world uh, hire these students. This is everybody from defense contractors in the United States, like the Raytheons and Boeings, all the way to the, uh, the service firms uh, in the tech space, as well as consulting uh, and others. And, and more recently, uh, internationally, that's been growing as well. So now there's a 270% increase in international co-ops. The big thing here is that for the US, 90% of the placement rate, 87 of which do it in their major, and 50% of whom get jobs based on where they worked, is a huge deal. That's, in the United States, we don't have any company hiring 20,000 graduates a year, so it's really a one-to-one -one relationship, and that experience makes a, makes a big difference. So what we're looking at is how do we bring the idea of cooperative education to India in a bigger way? Uh, and essentially, there's three opportunities there. It's, it's around the onboarding challenges. Increase the number of graduates ready to work by integrating intensive work uh, with the undergraduate experience, uh, providing a means to deliver supplemental content, essentially by the workers and by the workplace, for the students to boost their skills, particularly in new technologies, develop soft skills and professionalism in a big way, uh, and prepare our students for growth in, in emerging, emerging sectors. Uh, and we see that this has big, uh, can have a big impact in India uh, in the professional sectors like IT, where there's a, a need for globally relevant professional skills, but also in healthcare, where uh, a lot of the healthcare uh, educational institutions in India do not have an external component of uh, work in the field, work in the clinic. And so we've been working with the Public Health Foundation of India to look at uh, placements and externships and co-ops for pharmaceuticals or physical therapy or technicians and medicine. Uh, so that they can supplement the classroom experience, uh, which is very limited in India compared to the needs. Uh, and then finally, the, the, the targeted emerging sectors where there's a lack of trainers and faculty, such as health informatics and cybersecurity, where the work experience supplementing the classroom experience uh, can have a, a lot of impact. So I'll just, I won't dwell on this, but uh, we'd love to work with, uh, uh, if any of you think it'd be interesting to try in your organization having a, a six-month intern versus a traditional summer program, uh, we'd love to work with you. We're, we're actually in about 15 companies in India right now. And the, the goal is really for Northeastern because there's only so much we can do in India. The idea is to say, how do we bring different models of American education in a way that's relevant to India? And so again, you know, HBS has been here, our business school, Duke has been here, Northeastern's here. Uh, I think it won't be a one-size-fits-all in India, it'll be a one-size-fits-one. And so how do we bring more and more ideas uh, and share them with our Indian counterparts uh, and uh, take it from there. So uh, I'm here from Northeastern, but I work with all the other universities that I mentioned. So uh, if you're interested in speaking to any of those, I'm happy to share the presentation and, and connect any of you with them as well. Uh, so with that, I shall just I'll close this out and say thank you. And, uh, and if we have some time for one or two questions or comments, that'd be great. Any questions, anybody? Did I speak too fast? There we have it. We have it. Please. please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Shalini, and uh, I'm from Obichi Group. Um, uh, you know, you spoke uh, about this uh, internship and you know, kind of universities with cooperative and preparing for you. My question is for people from the other side. You know, is there an opportunity for many universities in the US? It's already working on professionals in the university for let's say an internship of three months or six months and not really the executive program that I'm talking about you know, in terms of real work. Right. Well, so what I was talking about is not the executive, it's, uh, it's the full-time student. Um, 
I, I don't know if anybody else is working on that. Uh, I think everybody does some mixture of internships. Uh, everybody does some mixture of uh, professional and, and, and full-time undergraduate, graduate. Uh, but I don't know if anyone's looking for specifically at what you would suggest.